Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. Welcome to Redefining Medicine. We are so pleased to speak with Dr. Tom Williams today. Dr. Williams is an expert on stress and HPA access who has spent his time since 1996 studying the mechanisms and actions of natural-based therapies, and he is also an expert in the therapeutic uses of nutritional supplements. Welcome. We're so happy to have you today. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, can you please explain your take on the HPA access primarily in the context of the stress response and chronic disease? Yeah, so this is something I've spent a lot of time on and, of course, you know, kind of coming into this in, in, in the 90s and then early 2000s, mm -hmm. this, the industry, um, integrative medicine community really understands that stress is a major part of chronic disease management, understanding the impacts of stress on, you know, pretty much every organ system in the body. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it kind of got, I would say, hijacked or maybe pushed over to the sort of what we call adrenal fatigue. So we thought of the adrenal gland is the problem or at least it, it kind of over time it just stops working and drives all of these um, chronic disease manifestations that we think of as as, as part of the stress response mm -hmm. um, so my kind of my mission let's say over the last decade has been to sort of it's the hpa axis the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and really to refocus on the brain refocus on what str what stressors are creating the triggering mechanisms for the stress response in the hypothalamus. Mm -hmm. And more recently, I've been thinking or, or trying to teach on the fact that the HPA axis is really a, an energy management system within the body. It's not really a quote unquote stress responder. It, is, it has to be that when you put it under certain stressors, but it's constantly supposed to be adapting to, you know, changes in the body, um, reacting to what, I mean, we call them stressors now, but they're really ways of, of redistributing the energy of the body to deal with whatever metabolic needs that are there. Mm -hmm. the, the unique part of that for humans is that we have a lot of anticipatory stress. We think a lot and we imagine all kinds of dangers, uh, some of which never come to pass, mm -hmm. but our body still responds to that as if it's going to be the same physiological requirements, metabolic uh, uh, you know, uh, changes as if it were really going to happen, like a physical stressor. We often talk about, you know, running from a lion. So, you know, if, if you're worried about your taxes or you're worried about, you know, your kids going to college or your finances or your relationships or your, or your boss, your body is going to physiologically respond in the same way that it would if it needed to repair a major, you know, kind of situation where you're running from for your life. And, you know, it dumps, let's say, glucose into your body because it's, it thinks you're going to burn all that glucose off. Well, you might be stressing, it might dump a bunch of glucose in your body to get ready for something and then you might just sit and watch Netflix all day. And so that is gonna then, you know, your body's then gonna store that as fat and it's gonna create inflammation. And so understanding the HPA axis as, as a stress responder in the brain is sort of the first step and then really understanding the HPA axis beyond that as a regulator of metabolism, as a regulator of circadian rhythm, that's really the thing that I'm trying to, to um, to teach mm -hmm. and get clinicians to really think about. What would you recommend to others to prevent high cortisol and stress levels? Okay. Well, I mean, obviously acute and chronic stress have an effect on metabolism. Um, they actually affect it differently. And that's kind of one of the things that, that I also teach is there's sort of this bi what we call a biphasic response to, to stress as it relates to metabolism. Normally, if you're relatively healthy, acute stress Mm -hmm. can be handled fairly well. Your body, you know, you get a hit of stress, you actually are, you know, producing cortisol is a good thing because it's supposed to, you know, it's, a, it's supposed to create that metabolic um, response to a stressor. If you are running or if you're needing, you know, more oxygen, more, more blood supply, uh, more glucose, you're gonna have it, okay? And even mitochondria, they, they function very well, they divide, they produce a lot of energy, they can quench the free radicals that are formed. But over time, mm -hmm. as we get chronic stress, um, the body begins m adapting, we might say maladapting or adapting you know, poorly to that, and then the efficiencies of those responses go down. Mm 
And so, like I said, mitochondria, they no longer produce as much ATP. They don't, they don't go into their activated state as well when you have chronic stressors. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I mentioned uh, earlier was the idea of circadian rhythm. So, you know, every day that you, you wake up, you produce a little more cortisol, um, it, you kind of create a cortisol spike, and that is kind of like the wake-up call for the rest of the body, and it, it's kind of a circadian signal. Well, over time, if you're using cortisol as a stress responder over and over and over a week in, month, a year, whatever, mm -hmm. then those circadian signals are, are dulled. They're not, they're not listened to as well. And so then you start losing your circadian metabolism. And circadian metabolism is very important to, to manage your, your, your overall metabolism. So these are the kind of things that, that the maladaption to stress, and we also know that early life stress, or stress when at, at a very young age, is also can kind of reset, it's sort of like a PTSD sort of resetting of the whole HPA axis, which is very difficult to reverse. So, so yeah, acute stress, I mean, some people even say, you know, there's a good stress, and you know, normally when you, know, you have a, a, an excitement or something happening, it kind of revs things up, it's kind of like, you know, your body's used to that. Mm -hmm. But it's this chronic, unending kind of thing that begins creating a maladaption. All of the switches start changing. And then when you do really need a stress response, then you're not able to do it. So yeah, it, there's, there's a lot there. As far as dealing with it, um, I mean, there's so many layers that we could talk about. So it's a little hard to go through every single one of them. But it really acknowledging and understanding the role of chronic stress is probably a a big part of that and then clinicians are very good at helping sort of help a patient what we call an inventory create an inventory of the stressors in their life mm -hmm. um, be you know especially those perceived stressors and really start to deal with them uh, one by one uh, you know there are a number of supplements um, that can help uh, adaptogenic herbs and these kind of things but I, I always put them at sort of the end because they're not the biggest levers. I mean, you know, sleep and relationships and finance and dealing with inflammatory triggers, these kind of things are much bigger than, than what you can do with, you know, Siberian ginseng and ashwagandha and, you know, rhodiola kind of thing. So um, there's kind of a, a, a layering of, of the need that you would do. So once you start working on all of that in your life, then you can kind of reverse it, correct? Like your Well, I think, I think most, I think many of the effects of stress can be reversed. Mm -hmm. I think um, just like with many things in our, bo in our body, there, there can be a new reset point. In the case, uh, probably one of the more extreme would be PTSD, where you see an extreme stressful situation and, and really change even the receptors, the sensitivities in the brain. And it's essentially, what, if you think about it, it's, the brain is trying to protect the rest of the body from an overproduction of cortisol, which, is, which can be damaging. And once you get to those stages, the question is, can you fully reverse? Can you fully bring them back? And I think in some cases, the answer is probably not fully, but that doesn't mean the person can't be optimized and can't you know, get to a, a very healthy state. They just may not be able to get back to that healthy. And, and that's true of probably a lot of things. Unfortunately, once you get to a certain age or a certain event happen, like a, like a tra traumatic event, like an injury, like in a car accident, there are certain things that break or are, you know, are going to be permanently damaged. I think the brain and the HPA axis have a little bit of that, that it's, there are certain things that are very difficult to reverse. Mm -hmm. I know you spoke about this a little bit, but what would you say are the four causes of stress and what steps can a patient take to reduce these? Yeah. So I, I actually teach sort of, I have a wheel that I teach off of, uh, and basically there are four areas. And the one that we talked to most about is perce the perception of stress. Mm -hmm. And that's not only just the events around us, but it's also sort of how the brain interprets that. And I talk about, you know, neuroendocrine system, you know, we have neurotransmitters, we have neurosteroids, we have en the endocannabinoid system. All of them, all of those signals and, and, and receptors affect that interpretation of the events around us. Public speaking can be, you know, very exciting for one person. It can be, you know, the next thing they want to do next to death uh, as far as the stress on the other end. Mm -hmm. So that, that, uh, that balance is a perception of that event. But the other three are circadian disruption. So anything related to sleep, jet lag, uh, third shift, working, these kind of things where, where the light is out of sync with your biology, um, inflammatory signals, like we talked about, um, anything that's, you know, the, the classic triggers of infl inflammation are, you know, TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-1, those are major, you know, those are major triggers 
for uh, the HPA axis and you know inflammation. Cortisol is an anti-inflammatory, so it's it's in that wheelhouse. And then the other one is glycemic dysregulation. In fact, the, the gold standard that was used in, in, in research for triggering a stress response is to give somebody insulin and drop their blood glucose. When you make them hypoglycemic, anybody that's been hypoglycemic knows they go through, you can start sweating, you get you know, chills and everything, and that's, that's an immediate fight or flight response, mm -hmm. but then it also is a major kicks in then the HPA axis, which you know, is the secondary uh, stress responder beyond epinephrine, norepinephrine. So those four, if a clinician can help them deal with their circadian biology, the inflammatory signals, whether it's a gut inflammation, joint inflammation, whatever, glycemic dysregulation, so make sure their blood sugar is not bouncing all over the place, and then the perceived stress. Those are gonna be the four areas that will, if you can cover, the, if you can really help a patient deal with those four areas, you're probably dealing with 80 to 90% of the things that are likely to stress um, the HPA axis. Wow, that's wonderful and so interesting. Um, also, how do you uh, de-stress? What are some habits that you recommend to others? Well, like I said, I, I, am, I am blessed to live on uh, a big, uh, in a big forest, essentially. I've got 130 acres and uh, wow, not nice. a lot of people around me, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, at least for that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and so I have, uh, except for my family, who I love, um, but I can get out in nature and that's pretty much how I de-stress is just to get out, do something, especially do something mm -hmm. with my hands. Most of my work is in you know reading and writing and you know mm -hmm. lecturing and, and trying to think of these kinds of things and so when i'm not doing that de-stressing is working with my hands doing some other things taking a walk in the woods um, looking for mushrooms or d doing whatever um, <laughs> and you know getting a perspective on life thankfully i i've been blessed not to be uh you know burdened with a lot of other chronic diseases which is helps mm -hmm. um, That's but wonderful. um so that that helps me um, how can you tell the difference between adrenal insufficiency and HPA axis dysfunction? Yeah, so this is an interesting question because I think going back to our, our discussion of adrenal fatigue, mm -hmm. um, you know, we do have something called adrenal insufficiency and, you know, primary adrenal insufficiency, Addison's disease, is really an autoimmune sort of destruction of the immune, uh, of the um, adrenal gland that produces, in this case, cortisol. Um, and so we do have that phenomena, and, and, we, and that creates this chronic, flat line, low cortisol levels. And so there, that's why I think in some ways people got confused between adrenal insufficiency and then adrenal fatigue as being sort of very similar. So that, that is a real phenomenon. However, most of stress-related or HPA axis dysfunction does not cause a destruction of the adrenal gland. In fact, the way you test for this is that you give ACTH, you give the triggering uh, hormone for producing cortisol. And in most people who have, even with chronic stress, if you inject them with, a, with ACTH, they will produce enough, they will have a cortisol spike. Mm -hmm. So most of what's going on in the, the HPA axis dysfunction, especially related to stress, is a, is a down regulation in the brain. So that can happen very immediately, like we said with PTSD, but it can happen over a long period of time with chronic stressors. And so um, those kinds of the differences. Now it's, you know, I always, I kind of, uh, I'm frustrated by this in some ways because I tell people adrenal fatigue is not about the adrenal glands, it's really about the brain. And in the medical literature, there's, a, there's something called secondary adrenal insufficiency and tertiary adrenal insufficiency. But all, actually, both of those are issues of the brain, not of the adrenal gland. So, unfortunately, if, it, it would it would be nice if they didn't name those tertiary, or secondary, and tertiary adrenal insufficiency because they do create a downregulation of uh, cortisol. So, for instance, if you give somebody corticosteroid therapy long enough, it will shut off the signals in the brain, lower the cortisol levels. But that's not an adrenal insufficiency as much as it is the signals coming from the brain have been downregulated. So, um, so that's the language I use. And I'll just, I'll just finish by saying this. Um, you know, when I started in this industry in the 90s, you know, DHEA, uh, the hormone DHEA and supplementation of that was supposed to bring everybody back to youth, okay? They said, you know, your DHEA is low when you're 30 and 40 and 50. If we just give you the DHEA of a 25-year-old, you'll be young again. And it turns out not to be true, um, but, you know, people moved on and said, well, DHEA is not the answer. And I think a lot of clinicians now realize there are appropriate ways of using that. And there are certain cells within the adrenal gland, they're different than the ones that produce cortisol, 
that produce DHEA. And it turns out that those cells are very sensitive to stress, you know, um, oxygen stress, reactive oxygen species, and regular kind of stress. And it very may, well may be that those tissues become more stressed out, mm -hmm. producing DHEA, attempting to you know, counterbalance cortisol, and that they do, and I don't want to use the term adrenal fatigue, but that they do then become exhausted to the point where you start tipping the scale towards cortisol, and that then tr creates the brain's down regulation. So um, it's kind of difficult to study those cells because the, the animals that we normally study, mice and rats and things like that, don't produce DHEA in their adrenal glands, so we don't have a good uh, animal model for this. But I think there's gonna be a revival of the understanding of DHEA, maybe not in, as an anti-aging you know, panacea, yeah. but I think um, there's gonna be a role for targeted DHEA to slow down the cortisol uh, dominance that drives you know, the stress, you know, effects of chronic disease. So I'm, I'm kind of excited about seeing where the research goes in that area and to maybe look at DHEA once again in a sort of a different light, mm -hmm. uh, very specific to driving or helping the HPA axis uh, adapt more uh, carefully to the, to the stressors around us. Yeah, that definitely sounds like some positive research. Yeah. We're happy to have you with A4M and thank you so much. Sure, I'm glad to be here. And don't forget to rate, subscribe, and leave us a five-star review. Thank you, everyone.